Hello. Hello to everybody who's um, watching from wherever you are. It's good to be in the room, though. But I love that... Um, I love that uh, the same God who's moving in this place amongst all these incredible people is the same God who's with every single person, wherever you might find yourself. It's like the middle of the night in America right now. There's, I got a feeling of someone in Kansas City and right in the heart of America. And uh, you're like just clinging to um, being awake, like practically, physically right now, but you're just clinging to life as well. And um, I don't know, that wasn't really the plan to sing that song right then, but maybe it was just for somebody who's, who's there right now. I just got that feeling. And, um, you matter so much to God, you have no idea, and your life matters. And um, <laughs> ah. And that's for anyone who's, who's here or who's watching or listening, you know. Yeah. I just got a feeling God's about to do something outrageous. I like <laughs> You can be seated. And if you're at home and you're standing, you can be seated as well. And I'm going to be seated as well. And uh, can we thank the team? Awesome tattoos. Is that a unicorn? It's like a dolphin unicorn. It's a what? An awal, a narwhal. Man, God bless that tattoo. Hello. So um, here's the thing. I woke up today, and, um, and I'm assuming you did as well. <laughs> and like, I hadn't, you know, it was one of those waking up experiences where I had no idea where I was. And uh, you know, the type where it's like, where am I? Because I wasn't, I wasn't at home. Um, I was like, where am I? Like, what's going on? And I'm just trying to find something to orientate me. And then I'm like, what time is it? Like, just have I slept in? And I'm like, thank God I haven't. And then it was like this heavyweight crushing kind of realization that um, I needed to figure out what I was going to say tonight and, uh, <laughs> and still be here on time. And, um, you know, waking up's a funny thing, you know, like being caught, you know, that liminal space where you just, you're not sure like where you are, I hate waking up. It's the worst part of my day. It has been since I was a little kid. I still get haunted in the morning by the sound of my mom's shrieking voice. <laughs> get up. Ciao. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't say, didn't say you, don't sound, you don't sound anything like that, mom, to be fair. But it's so funny, I still have nightmares about it. <laughs> and. But you know that moment where you, see, you just don't, like you're just trying to figure out what's going on and you're stuck between like, you're stuck between being unconscious and like becoming conscious. And it's like, what's going on? Like, and you want to stay there. And the strange thing is like, the only thing I hate more than waking up is I hate going to sleep. It's weird. It doesn't matter how tired I am. I don't like going to sleep. I want to stay awake as long as I can. And it's like, it takes me half a day to figure out like, what's going on, that it's actually daytime and I'm alive and I'm a part of this thing called life. And then it takes me half a day like to kind of just wrestle the concept of, of turning the switch off and, and just shutting off everything and actually closing my eyes and mainly shutting off my brain and, and going to sleep. And uh, it's funny. But I woke up this morning and I was just trying to figure out what I was going to say. 
And the weird thing is I knew what I was going to say tonight three years ago. <laughs> Except for I'm not going to say it. And um, because that message was for then. And I was meant to speak here two years ago. And I knew right away when we kind of like locked in having this conference what I wanted to say then. And so I was like hanging on that word. And I mean, that message for, if you care to know, it was called um, The Art Never Died. It merely moved to a cheaper neighborhood. I think they've got a title, you can put it up there. And then it was like a poor man's guide to reclaiming the unforeseen riches of our redemptive discontent. <laughs> and <laughs> it's such a good message. Uh, I'll, look, I'll approximate it just in case it's for someone here who's like two years behind, but that's not true. That's not true at all. That's a bad joke. But I do think it, it could be helpful, and, and maybe at some other time it's going to be helpful. See, it's like, it's like a song, you know, like sometimes it's the right time to bring a song, and other times it's like not the right time to bring that song. And Like if, if I could understand the mystery of all of that, like then I'd be a really, really good songwriter, and a, we, we try and it's just a scramble fest, and then you just kind of like go, I th this feels right. Like could, like could Grace, for example, that song we were singing here last year, like that song's, like, that song's so old but it had to go through like a whole period of time where it kind of felt like it was new again. And then when it came around, it was like, oh, it's one of them old ones that feel, somehow feels like a new one and it's just right for now. Like if that song had it came out when it was written as it was then, it just wouldn't be the same song. And it's like all the, all the good songs or at least like half semi, like, you know, I mean, good is relative, I guess, when it comes to what a song is. I mean, it's different for everyone. Someone's favourite song is going to be different to somebody else's favourite song. And, but it's, you know, there's just a timing thing, right? Like, it's just, you just got to, at some point, let it go. And other times go, you know what? It's not right. It's, it's, it's not right for now, or it's not quite finished, or it's not quite there. And the song we just sung is an example of a song that was, like, kind of there for a long time, but it was never right there. And then it made sense when it came together and I was just singing it now. It was like slapping me in the face again because that song was finished really like a, this time last year. And, um, and yeah, so I'm just still a bit rattled by that song that strangely enough, I was a part of writing and um, God's funny. Like that song, all those words, I know what they mean. I, I know them, but then it just was like, maybe that's what I need to say is that song right now, but that's not it. But this message, to summarise what it was about, really was the fact that there was a period in my life about five years ago, and I was just like having one of those moments where I just didn't feel motivated and I didn't feel inspired, and I just, it was like a random day, and I woke up in New York and I was living downtown, and I didn't really... Everything was good, like I'd been married for a few years, I'd been married long enough to know like the for better part and the for worse part. And, um, but my marriage was good and uh, you know, I had a kid and he was awesome and like super annoying at the same time. And, and uh, like everything's good, like church was going well, I was, I was like just happy, like content, you know? Like we just come off tour at the time and Everything felt like it went well, like there was nothing kind of bad to report about anything and I was just kind of, it's kind of felt like stuck in one of those places, you know, like those, I don't know where I'm at, don't know what's next, don't really feel like doing anything. And, uh, and then my friend Joe Tamini, some of you know, we like to call him the hurricane and because when he walks into a, a room, that's what it feels like. And I, actually, funnily enough, I stole this hat from Joe the other week. So thank you, Joe, if you come around to appreciate the hat. But Joe, when I, when I moved to New York, you know, like I, I felt like there were so many relationships here that I was kind of, that I forged over a lifetime. And I was like, God, like, what do I, what do I, um, what do I need? Like when I go to New York, I was like, honestly, I just need a couple of like bros that feel like I've known them forever and maybe a wife. Um, <laughs> and so God gave me my wife, Esther, and he gave me the Tamini brothers, John and Joe. And they're literally like two extremes of um, 
Like John is like real matter of fact. He was like this business guy in real estate. When I met him, he was like in a, a suit and he's like, everything about him is kind of perfect. And then Joe's like the complete opposite. He's just a wild man. And, um, and God was so good. And these two guys became my best friend in quick time. Like Joe's an artist and John's kind of like a, you know, I don't even know how to describe John. But Joe was there and Joe calls me on this day and he says, hey, Joel, let's hang. And I'm like, you know what? I don't know. I don't really. He's like, no. And Joe doesn't take no for an answer. He's like, we're doing this, we're doing this, we're doing this. Like he gives you 300 things you're gonna do in that day. And it was one of those days I didn't feel like doing anything. And I was like, Joe, honestly, this sounds like the worst day ever. Um, he's like, just come on. And so anyway, I make my way over to Brooklyn. He just moved to Brooklyn and um, he'd been in the city and you know, he, he grabs me and he's like, come on, let's go for a walk. And we, we start walking around and Joe, he's like one of those kind of guys that he, like his mouth moves at the speed of his feet. And so he walks really fast and he talks really fast and he's just going on about all kinds of things. He's always got a camera around his neck. He's a photographer and he's an artist and he's just like taking photos of random things and I'm just like hungry. I just want to eat some food. And we're walking down the street and mostly he's rambling on about like how much like Williamsburg, which is in Brooklyn has changed. And it's true, like it had changed so much in just the short amount of time that we'd been there. And when, when we first moved to New York, Carl and Laura, Laura's up here and Ava, Ava was very, very small. Um, you know, I, I kind of end up like crashing at their house and <clears throat> and then life moves on and then here we are walking down the street and I, I just remember Joe stopped and um, he was taking a photo of something and so I was kind of just like stopped and waiting for him as I am and Joe just takes photos of, of anything, like really innocuous things like that don't seem like there's a photo in it but he finds something magnificent. That's what makes him great at what he does. And, um, and as I'm waiting for him, I look up and then amongst all these kind of like new construction buildings that had gone up in Williamsburg, there's just this old building, you know, um, classic brownstone, you know, like kind of decrepit, the fire escape out the front and really small windows. And I just remember looking up there and, and it just someone had painted outside a window, artists still live here. And I was like, oh man. And I know I told Cass this like two years ago and I know then that, that was what I was gonna talk about. And then you guys did a whole thing on it and it was really cool. And that's one of the reasons also I didn't feel like that message is for now, but I'm telling you this much, we might go all the way. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I was like, whoa. And it was like, what grabbed me, it was, it, was, it was like the first whoa moment I'd had in a while. And it doesn't seem like much, but it was, I'm like, Joe, like, what do you, like, take a photo of that. I'm like, Joe, check it out. Artists still live here. And Joe just kind of comes by as he does. He looks at it and he goes, ha. He's like, you know, the art never died. It just moved to a cheaper neighborhood. And I was like, Phew. and he just walked on and kept talking <laughs> and taking photos of things. And oh, I'm looking at this thing and it was like, oh my goodness. Like, and um, I was just reminded of, the fact that like, one, I used to, there's so many times like, the inspiration is not something you have to chase after, it just flows out of where you're at. But the problem was, you know, we get comfortable. And it's not kind of the, the best incubator for our art. And um, there's a challenge for us as the church and it's a challenge for us as individuals. And I think, you know, like there's that classic quote, you know, it says that, you know, art exists to comfort the disturbed and to disturb the comfortable. And I was thinking about the fact that like what art does is it gentrifies, it changes the landscape. And I was thinking about Williamsburg, like it's where all the artists lived and everyone's getting priced out and all the artists have got priced out and they went there when it was cheap as chips as did most of our staff at the time and then they all got priced out and moved to New Jersey um, and then all the artists moved a suburb out to Bushwick which now no one can afford anything there either because what happened is the artists travel to where basically they can afford it because artists are generally poor and they turn the whole neighborhood around and then you know, everything becomes worth more and then they get priced out and you have to figure it out. And, uh, and I was going, man, like, there's some, so much in that because, like, there's something about 
what drives us to be creative that comes out of lack and need and necessity. And for me, it's always been a discontent. Like when, when, when I first started writing songs, like it was literally because like we didn't really like the songs that we were singing and we didn't really have much singing. sing. And to be honest, like the best thing that we were doing at the time was like we were reappropriating lyrics to like popular songs on the radio. For, for, for youth, and then that kind of, there's something disingenuous about that. Like, I remember one time um, I made my brother like sing, uh, it was, you know, like Rage Against the Machine, Killing in the Name of, but we changed it to, to Living in the Name of, and it was like, uh, <laughs> it was like crucified because Jesus died, covered my sin, and now I'm robed in white, sanctified, he rose to life. No, sanctified from death to life. He rose again, and I'm living in the name of. And uh, that was cool for a moment, but like that wasn't enough. And <laughs> but that was the thing that kind of was like, man, let's like write songs. And that's kind of always been the thing. It's just the thing that drives me. Like if I have to write songs or like leave, tr truthfully, like sometimes it's like, I don't feel like, just doing it to add to the noise. Like there's so many good songs right now. Like I don't feel like, but then another time have some God does something in your life. It's like, oh my gosh, I have to get this out. And we have to find that space. And you know, the greatest enemy to what I feel like God wants to do in us often is just getting comfortable. And you know, I, I was just thinking about this actually. I started one time, like I was young and Phil Dooley, who's over there, he called me, he's like, Joel, we're making a video for youth. And I was like, sounds awesome. I was in school and he's like, all right, I need you to grab some bed sheets from, from home and meet us at the chicken farm, which at the time was where we were going to be having church, which is somewhere down there. And, um, and so we went down there and, and he's like, okay, we're doing a video and it's about Elijah and calling down fire from heaven and you guys need to play the prophets of Baal. And um, I'm like, great. So like next thing you know, like we're running around like when these bed sheets um, trying to like perform like ritual, like cutting ourselves. And so we had tomato sauce and stuff. And, and <laughs> I think it was just an excuse to have a bonfire, truthfully, I'm not sure. But, you know, I think about that and it was like the best of times. You just make do with what do. And then, then it became a thing. It's like, man, we need to make videos every week for youth. And then, you know, we had a team and we had access to stuff. And so it became about making videos. I remember walking around this place and we would just use whatever you could find. It's like, hey, like, can you act? Can you act? All right, you're in it. What have you got? What have you got? Like, let's do this. And there were times and moments where it was like, we got nothing and I couldn't find anybody to be in the video. And so we would go downstairs and raid the kids' um, department because I had puppets and stuff. And then we were doing like animations and it was like all this stuff, it just flowed out of lack. And I think the biggest, one of the biggest lies of the enemy for us is just like this sense of like, oh man, like, if I had this or if I had that or if I had this, then, then like, you know, God could use me. And it's just a lie. It's actually the opposite. Like if, if you're a painter and you're like, I don't, you don't have paint and you don't have a canvas and you don't have like, like a giant loft like to paint in, like an artist loft, like you see all those painters who like, you know, like, so what, you're just supposed to wait until you have all that stuff to paint? No. Like if you gotta go outside and like just dig up some clay and start mixing it up, like get going. Like, and the thing is like most great artists, especially the ones like, like I think about Basquiat, like, cause he, you know, like Bowery, like in New York, for what it's worth, no one could ever afford to live there. It's so expensive. But when he lived there, it was like the worst part of town. Like you wouldn't go there unless you were prepared to die. But he didn't, you know, Basquiat, he like just started going out and graffitiing the streets. That's what he did. And now, like, his artwork is like, who knows what that's worth? But it's just this process of, like, understanding that not just that, like, God calls us to gentrify culture. And sometimes we're sitting there going, where's the next big idea? Like, how are we meant to compete with this? How are we meant to do that? And it's just not it. Sometimes we have to be reminded that... Uh, Blessed are the poor in spirit, you know, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And be reminded that the first thing Jesus did when he stepped into ministry and he got before all the people in the temple is, he says, you know, I've come to bring good news to the poor. 
And that's what, like we can all do that. And if we use our gifts, whatever they are, like, man, God will give us everything we need to do, everything that He's calling us to do in that moment. And it's a process and it's a journey. And so that's what that message was about, but I'm not going to talk about that. <laughs> uh, so then I, I was like, the other message I had was uh, life and other near-death experiences. And um, it was actually the first chapter, well, was, is, and is to come, the first chapter of the book, I was, is, and is to come writing. And um, once upon a time and place chasing a blowing of the wind and Um, we could go with this one. But I was going to talk about like childbirth, you know, like just that moment where we come into the world. Like I was born, I woke up the first time, it was four in the morning on the 18th of September, 1979. Do you math? That's 40 years ago. That makes me 40 years old and that's why I play golf. <laughs> and, uh, I was born like 10 pounds and something... God bless my mom. And, um, but I don't remember it, you know, like I was there, but I don't remember it. I remember when my son was born, like I had all these grand plans and ideas for it. Like I was gonna like deliver the baby and cut the umbilical cord and then like cook up the placenta later and eat it. I wasn't gonna do that, it's like. <laughs> uh, but we got there, man. And like, it was just, I, I was a nervous wreck. And I don't really remember much about the whole ordeal. I just remember seeing my boy for the first time, just like this thing with like arms and legs going crazy and just thinking, what is that? Like, <laughs> and looking at my wife, I'm like, what have they done to you? Like, <laughs> and um, it still messes me up. And the thing is, that's it, like childbirth is messy. Like, you know, by the time, you know, you see your baby photo, like you see that thing, they've cleaned you up, they've fixed everything up, like everything's nice and beautiful. But like that moment when you came into the world, like it came in pain. <laughs> a whole lot of push and pull. A whole lot. It's messy. I think about it now, it's like, it's the messiest thing ever. And like, it's still like the most beautiful thing ever. Like, it's like the most beautiful moment of my life. I was laying eyes on my boy and looking at my wife and just going, oh my goodness, there is a God. And sometimes I think, you know, maybe like, whatever the story of your life is and whatever, well, you know, whether the, the picture is pretty and it's framed and it's hanging on a wall, like no matter how perfect your family's been, how perfect the journey's been or how much it makes you feel like you're a mistake, how messy life is, I'm telling you, like your life is the most beautiful thing. It's a gift. And I remember being, when I was 19, again, this is a story that took place with Phil Dooley and we were having a board meeting, like, because I was a volunteer here at youth at the time and so we went surfing and, <laughs> and uh, discipleship. And, um, and I drowned that day, like for real. And, um, you know, it was one of those moments where I was, I was everything was perfect, like, and I didn't see, I took a wave and I wondered why no one else was on it. And I was like, oh, this is wonderful. Like, man, this is great. And I turned around and I realized why no one else was on it because I, I didn't see what was coming behind it. And I got caught inside and, uh, and I remember just like losing, like just getting smashed basically. And I, like at first it's fun, you know, like when you get smashed, you're like, whoa, this is fun. Like everything's moving around like crazy, you know, it feels like, like a rag doll in a washing machine, you know, like there's something beautiful about losing control and you're just like riding it out. And then there's this moment where you go, oh my goodness, like I'm still like, I don't know which way's up and down and I've been down here a long time. And then there was a second wave 
And then I was like, all right, this is bad. This is really bad. And then it was like fighting for dear life. And so like, you know, in those moments, like when you're out of control, you're meant to just conserve energy. Just go with it. At some point, you know, you're going to figure your way back to the top. It's going to be good. You're going to find the bottom. But then this wasn't like that. This was like, all right. And so I just started, went to panic mode. Like I'm talking about arms and legs flailing, like just searching for anything to not knowing anything. And then I'm like, I'm going to die. And then I, I finally kind of saw the surface. And so I'm like scrounging to get there, but all the water was like all aerated and I didn't know what was happening. And so I'm like fighting, fighting, fighting. And I couldn't get my, I could get my eyes above the water, but I couldn't get my mouth above the water. And then I saw another wave coming. And so I, I just tried to take a breath and I just swallowed a whole lot of water and the third wave hit me. And I'm like, that's it. I'm dead. This is it. And then sure enough, I like started having all these euphoric moments, like these like life flashing before my eyes kind of moments and just being like, oh, this isn't so bad. Like, wow. Like, and I guess oxygen wasn't getting to my brain properly and I was going, wow, this is wonderful. And, and, and then I don't really remember what happened next, but I remember waking up on the surface and I'd traveled honestly about half a mile down the beach. It was, a beach was called DY. Why it's called DY, I don't know. But, but the area where I found myself was called No Man's. And it was just kind of the area of beach that exists between like two real beaches. And so everyone just calls it no man's land. And, um, and I, I had no energy. And I remember in that moment, I just remember feeling like I am, like my flesh and my bones, they're not working. Like I can't move my arms and legs, but I've never been more alive on the inside. And I don't know how to get from here to there. And I just let wave after wave push me. And I remember like getting washed up on the shore. And I remember sitting there and like just going, like never been more grateful in my life. And I remember looking at the sand and it was, I was holding it in my hand. I remember just going, oh my God, sand, you're the most beautiful thing in the world. Look at all you little grains of sand. You're like me. You've, you've been tossed and turned by the ocean and you've been blown by the, the winds of time and you've, you've ended in this place right now to share this existential moment with me together and like, Thank you, sand. You were awesome. And I was just like, oh my God, like sky and like everything, like everything just looked like I was seeing it for the first time. My eyes were foggy and I didn't know what was going on. I couldn't move. And I just sat there for ages, just getting beat up by the shore. And I had to wait for like kind of blood circulation to get back into my legs. And I remember walking like, wobble, like all the way down the beach and just kind of just being grateful. Like I've never been grateful before. Like I'm just seeing everything different. And uh, I remember getting back to the, to the car and feels like, what's up, man? It looks like you've seen a ghost. And I'm like, I did. Like, I think I did. Like you, you'll never. That was when I was 19. And the thing is, like, right after that, like, my whole world got flipped on its head. And I was trying to figure out 19 who I was and what I was supposed to do. And I didn't think I had anything particularly special to offer God. But I was grateful to be alive. And I guess a lifetime later, like 38, a couple of years ago, I found myself in a place where I'm, like, fighting against dear life because I felt dead on the inside. I'm like, how does that happen? And so, um, now there was this moment and I was sitting at my house. We'd moved upstate New York and had this big long driveway and I didn't see it coming and I just found myself honestly in the middle of the night like kind of laying in the middle of that driveway like kind of just staring at the sky and um, looking out the driveway and kind of feeling like I wanted to go but I didn't have anywhere I wanted to go and kind of feeling like I wanted to run but and I remember looking back at my house and everything was perfect about it again. I was just, it seemed like I just couldn't explain it. And I don't know how long I stayed there. It was like this, like this full circle moment because the story that I just told you about being 19, like that was a story again that kind of framed that book that I was writing that I'm going to write that will one day be written. And But I was kind of like waiting for like what the end of the chapter was and I, I couldn't find it. And in the meantime, like something else was going on and I found myself in this place where I just lost perspective and I lost passion. 
man, I couldn't find a reason to kind of like, I just felt like there wasn't anything to look forward to. And it was a perspective moment. Like I just couldn't see it. And I remember getting up because it started raining and I was walking back to the house and then um, like it started pouring and, and I just felt like God just said, stop, like get on your knees, you know. And I remember thinking, I would, God, but it's raining. <laughs> I don't want to get my knees wet. <laughs> and then it was like that waking up moment, you know, we're like, oh my goodness. Like I'm here hanging on. And I'm like not willing to get on my knees in my own driveway because I don't want to get my knees wet. And so I did, and then I just started laughing my head off and crying at the same time. And like, it was like waking up. I couldn't see the other side, but I was like, this is funny. And I reckon it was the first time I laughed like proper for a while. And I see that moment now, and I was like, oh goodness. Like, like what that moment was when I was in the driveway was like the lyrics and the verse of that song we were singing, you know, like I've been strong and I've been broken and within a moment, like I'm just like wrestling this conflict of these things that are like things you think you figured out. And so anyway, I was going to tell you this message because it goes somewhere awesome and, but I, that's not the thing. And here's the thing. About 10 minutes before we got started tonight, like I felt like God gave us the thing I meant to say. And um, I'm going to get there and I would tell you right now and save us the next 10 minutes because it's only going to take me about one minute to tell you. (laughs) But it's kind of not that spectacular and I think that's why it's awesome. And... um, So then you're probably wondering why this is here and that's because the other message I was going to speak as of last night was called Rock Stars, Stumbling Blocks and Other Overhead Projections. (laughs) And it was kind of just, it was mainly, it was kind of like, because the first job I ever had in church proper, like the first time I ever had a role, like something I did for church was I was an overhead projection kid and it was obviously, you know, because I was the pastor's kid and the privileges of nepotism and whatnot. And, uh, and it was awesome. And I was thinking about, mum pulled this up today and I was like, it's meant to be like this. I turned to dad, I said, I was gonna talk about overhead projectors and, and like this marvelous device, you know, there's like this light that's in there and transparency and then there's a mirror there and well, normally there is, this, might, this is like a kind of technological one that has a camera attached where there would normally be a mirror, but basically light projects from up there and it's plugged into a power source, obviously, and it goes through and it reflects and you need a canvas and basically then, if I was to turn this song on, does this thing work? Is there a light switch? Basically, my job was being this person and, and does, it's on. There's a big sign that says on. I missed it. So anyway... My job was to put the words up, and I, I really didn't really care much about the music at church at the time, but I was like, this is something to do. And I think my parents kind of, my dad was pretty smart, and so my job would be to like, this would normally work with light, but it doesn't, and so there it is. So, you know, we'd put the lyrics up, for example, this song, Heaven Suffers Violence, words of music by Brian Houston. Oh, there it is. It takes a while to heat up, and so my job, my job would to be to, we had like a little box with all the things finally put in there. Um, and then the worship leader would, you know, we had like a, a, a worship list, but we'd be ready for the Holy Spirit to move. And so we would kind of be like, oh, I think he might go here. And we'd, we'd have all the other songs ready to go. And then we kind of got technologically advanced. And so we started kind of like just doing this. You know what I'm saying? Like, I was like, like we're going to be revolutionary. It was awesome. And then we started building like borders. So we built the borders around here and started framing. And then one time 
uh, one of the songwriters came up to me and he said, hey, Joel, you know, legally you need to make sure that the songwriter's name is visible at all times. And I remember thinking, you're a jerk. <laughs> and so I made sure that his name was never visible again. <laughs> and, and then my friends, like the other kids at school would be like, so we, back then we were at the warehouse and so we had like a little screens on both sides. So my friend Joel Wood, Nathaniel Wood's brother, who we were best friends, clearly because we had the same name, um, were, were either side, and it was kind of like it was a bit of a competition to make sure he didn't make a mistake. And it was awesome. Everyone's like, hey, great job this morning. And then after a little while, people just started getting like super mad at us and be like, hey, you got to move the lyrics faster and like all these different things. And then I was thinking about this device, and I was like, I feel like I'm looking at a, one of these now. I'm like, that's me. Like, I'm an overhead projector. And the thing is, like, Like, we're trying to reveal the Word of God. I'm just summarizing what the message is. I'm not preaching it. I've got something else to say. <laughs> Our job is to get the Word in front of people, right? This is basically, I'm summing it up. And then I was going to talk about Peter. So I was going to use the Bible for those of you going, he hasn't used the Bible yet. I'm getting there. <laughs> but this is a Word made flesh kind of message. And you'll, get, you'll see. Our job's to get, but Peter, you know, so there's this moment where Jesus says to his disciples, you know, who do you say that I am? Like, who do people say that I am? And they say, oh, some say John the Baptist, and some say Elijah, and some say Jeremiah, or another prophet. And then Jesus says, no, but who do you say that I am? And then I was like going, oh, sorry, no, I was saying this. And Peter says, um, <laughs> Simon, I should say, Simon, who means listener, says, I'm trying to wrap this up in one minute so that I can then say three minutes more of things before I tell you the one thing I want to say. He says, you know, you're Jesus, the son of, uh, you're, you're the son of, you're the Messiah, the son of God. And, uh, and then, you know, Jesus says, hey, you're right. Like, and, and that God revealed that to you. And uh, that's why I call you Peter. And on this rock, I'll build my church. And, and, um, and then, you know, a few scriptures later, he goes on. And, and then, he, you know, he says, and so anyway, now that you've figured that out, uh, you need to know that, like, I'm going to I'm going to get killed. And Peter's like, no way, I'm not letting that happen to you. And then he says, get behind me, Satan. Uh, you're a stumbling block to me. And I was thinking about that. And I was like, Peter goes from being a rock star to a stumbling block in like five verses. And it made me think about like what it is that we do, you know, because we can be operating in our calling and doing what God's called us to do. And we can be somebody who reveals who God is to people because we get that revelation from God if we think like, Or we can like get in the way, you know, and like become a stumbling block. And so I was going to do all these cool things with like blocking like us, you know, and then I was going to use these words to be like, you know, we can put all these different things because what we do is we start projecting our own versions of things so we can write insecurity. I was going to do all this really cool stuff and like we can take hurts and we can write all this stuff. And next thing you know, people can't see what they're meant to be seeing because all they see is our projections instead. And it was a really good message. But it's not, I just, it's actually not what I'm supposed to say. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> I came back to like waking up this morning and then I was on my way here and I'm like, I don't know, like I'm, I've got all these messages, there was a few others as well. And I'm like, I don't know which one, I don't know which one, I don't know which one, like maybe this, maybe that. And then like, I just felt like um, like all of those messages, they felt like last night's takeout, you know, like, like there's good stuff in there, you can eat it. It's like, I mean, if it's a pad thai, like Thai food, it's so good the next day. Like pizza's arguably better the next day, cold. Um, and I started going like, God, I need stuff, like what? what like, what's the thing now? Like, and all of these messages, ultimately, we're going to get wrapped up in, like, the theme, because I realized there was a theme for tonight, and it's divine perspective. And so then I was like, oh, maybe I just, like, talk about a whole bunch of, like, cool, divine, like, ways of looking at the world. I'm like, oh, my goodness, like, perspective. All of these things I'm telling you about, it's all about perspective. Like, this is a perspex sheet. <laughs> Video. Killed the transparency star because we got replaced with video and our job got redundant. But also the other part of that story was 
See, when we moved to the new building, which was the Hill Center back there, like it was like a theater like this, and so there was no room on the left and right, so then two became one, and so we ended up, like me and Joel, becoming like a, kind of like a team at first, like in the middle of the stage, and, you know, we'd work together, and it was awesome, and the thing was, but the moment that we got on stage, it was like you're surrounded by the band, and it's like a whole different perspective, and you're looking at things, you're going, oh my goodness, people, and I started like wearing more gel in my hair, I started thinking about what I was wearing, I was aware that... Uh, the girls I liked at the time, Ainsley Taylor and Elizabeth Carpenter, wherever you are, you probably have different last names right now, that they're probably seeing me and looking at me, and then I was, you know, everything changes. <laughs> and um, I was like, oh, what's the thing right now? Like, so I was like, hey, what's the last thing that, like, What's the last like, great revelation I've had, you know? And I was like, hey, what's God been saying to me this week? And then I was like, actually nothing. That might shock some people, but I'm just being real with you. I was like, I don't know, like, what, what God's, what's God been saying in His Word? Like, I mean, I've been, I don't know. There's no one thing. Like, normally there's something, but there's not. And what's, like, God been saying in the last, like, what's the thing? And I'm like, oh, my goodness. Like, I'm like, are you serious? And it's not for lack of, I'm not doing anything different. Like usually I've got a million things. I'm like, this is the thing like I want to say. Like this is fire burning in my bones. I've got to give this to people. Like this is, I didn't, nothing. And then I realized what it is that I've got to say. And it's simply this, like I'm still here. And like, maybe that's it. Like, it's not spectacular, but I'm still here. And I'm not saying that, like, I'm still here. Like, I'm here. But I'm saying it like, I'm still in the place I was in two years ago when I didn't want to get my knees wet. Like, I'm still in that chrysalis. Like, I'm still in that liminal space kind of waiting for what God wants to do next. And I don't know what it looks like. I got a clearer picture. But the difference between where I am now and where I was then, it's just time and perspective. But I'm still waiting. And I'm still, perhaps more than ever, trusting God with whatever's next, and I don't know how long it's going to take. But I realized that all of these messages I had, and I had other ones, I had one about like transformers and Decepticons and like the idea that like God wants to transform us. Like this is what this is about. It's about transformation and it's a process. And I was going to tell you really vulnerable stories that I swore to God I'd never tell anybody about, my, you know, like how I used to have this giant hole in my chest and I was so afraid of it and how I used to like pray to God like every single, as a kid, every single night, like God, heal me of this thing. Heal me of this thing. Like, you know, and, and I would go to bed at night and I'd be like, I'd put my hand on my chest, be like, God, pray. My friends used to call me the praying man. As Casey Scott used to call me the praying man, because I used to walk around with my hands like this all the time, hunched over, because I am. Um, I was so afraid. Well, one, because I was a Christian, and 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 so they called me the praying man. But two, because I looked like a praying man. Because I was afraid that anyone was going to touch me would see that I don't have a chest, like where there's a giant cavity where my heart's meant to be. And I mean, it's big enough that I used to, my friends used to make me, you're a, Casey's a terrible friend, but he's my best friend now. But he's a terrible, terrible friend. He'd be like, Joel, eat cereal out of it. And I'd be like, okay. And then I'd be like, put cereal in it and milk and like. <laughs> I used to be like, God, like just heal me of this thing. Like I used to go on every single altar call. I'd be like, like God, why don't you just heal me? Like, you know, like I trust in you. I used to be like, God, like I won't sin for like the longest amount of time. Like if you'll just heal me, like I just won't do it. And I would do it. I would see it all the way through. And I would wake up the next morning. I'd be like, all right, God's gonna heal me in the morning. I'd wake up and be like, no, it's still there. You know, years later, I was 24. I ended up in a children's hospital in Norfolk, Virginia of all places, getting a surgery that up until then didn't exist. It was affecting my breathing. They told me that, you know, I used to walk around and people were like, why are you making that noise? I'm like, what noise? I'm like, because <laughs> my lungs were getting all squashed up with my heart and stuff. And 
I had like a couple of millimetres between my sternum and my spinal cord and my, my back was all out of shape. And, you know, all these years later, to the point where I was kind of just settling into living with it, you know, this thing pops up and I just do a search and there's this new guy, he does a surgery, and, but you can only do it on kids. You know, like can't do it because oh, my bones were too like formed. Like for real, like because kids have bendy bones. And um, I was devastated, like, and I remember being there, I'm no, and, and I was like, oh, and the doctor's talking to me about like, talking about, you know, like maybe we could do it, but you know, probably the bones won't set right and it could just go back to how it's always been. And I'm like kind of gutted. And I'm like, I'm probably willing to give a shot anyway. And he stops and he grabs my hands and he starts like, like bending my fingers around. And I just thought this was a party trick that I could bend my hand in half. <laughs> and he does a couple of tests. And he's like, oh, you got Marfan syndrome. So I'm like, that sounds terrible. Am I dying? And <laughs> he's like, no, it just means you have bendy bones. And I was like, oh. And so they went and did surgery. It's a long story, but um, they just put these little cuts here and they flipped my chest inside out. And, uh, and then I woke up and then I was like kind of like really heavy drugs for ages. And, um, and then I was on an epidural, like, like what you have, like a, what usually women have during childbirth. And <laughs> they're like, went to do x-rays after about two weeks and then they're like, oh, hey, um, like the bars have moved, like they're out of place, like we're gonna have to go in again. And I'm like, oh, okay, like I was on drugs actually. So I was just like, oh, sounds great. Like, um, <laughs> And, and then uh, I remember waking up and like one of those moments where I had no idea where I was, like one of those waking up from after you've been on anesthetic or whatever. And, and before I knew anything, it was just pain, like, like the most tremendous pain. And like, I think I have a good pain threshold. I actually don't. Like my wife, she, like her toenail rips off and I'm like, oh goodness. And she's like, oh man. And I'm like, <laughs> but <laughs> like this pain was kind of different and I couldn't, I, I don't even know if I ever opened my eyes. All I remember was just this shooting pain and this thud on my back, like every 30 seconds or so, 20 seconds, it's banging on my back. And my mom's there and I can hear my mom's voice, but this time when I'm waking up, it's not annoying. It was like the sweetest thing in the world. She's like going, it's gonna be okay, darling. It's gonna be okay, darling. I'm like, what are they doing to me? Like, where am I? Like the pain was everywhere from like the, the top of my jaw all the way down to like my hips and my pelvis. And it was just like everything in me. And like pain is relative. It's one of those things. But I just remember going like, this is not right. And basically what happened is when I woke up, Obviously, I was groaning before I woke up because I knew what was going on. The epidural wasn't in my spinal column, so I had no pain medication. And they're trying, the doctor's trying to get the needle into my back. And it lasted what seemed like an eternity. But I remember saying to my mum, like, I just want to die. Like, I don't, like, make it go away. I just want to die. I just want to die. And she's like, it's okay, it's okay. And I don't know how long it lasted, but it felt like it wasn't worth a lifetime of being pain-free for what that felt like in the moment. But at some point, that needle went into my back. And I just remember it like instantly, like just the pain disappeared. And I like fell back and I don't remember what happened next. But I was like... You know, like pain, it's, it's relative, you know, and like everyone goes through it and we go through seasons of pain and no one can tell you whether or not you should feel the pain. You feel, you feel it, like that's fine. God knows it. He knows it. And I promise you like, It doesn't matter how impossible it might feel like I believe that there's a God who can remove the weight of that pain from you, allow you to heal the way you need to. And the process, like maybe you're kind of in a space where you're kind of waiting like just for, 
you're kind of waiting for the other side. Like maybe you're in like that space between. Like I heard guys talking about it earlier and I realized, you know what, everything, the whole journey is this moment of being in these spaces in between. And it's like, sometimes it feels like nothing's happening. It feels, sometimes it feels like God's not answering our prayers. Sometimes it feels like the pain will never go away. Sometimes it feels impossible to bear. Sometimes it feels like you just feel numb. Sometimes it feels like you're just grateful for everything. Sometimes it feels like But this journey we're on, like all these spaces in between, they all make sense on the other side. And see, here's the thing I never knew. It's like when they went in that second time, you know, to fix me up in the surgery, they found like this thing. It was like a, a giant cyst. They're like, that thing would have become a tumor. And like we cut it out and it's great. But like we didn't see it the first time and we would never have seen it the second time. And who knows? Like God knew. Like what if I had this ailment my entire life that was the bane of my adolescent existence because God knew there was something in me that needed to be removed at some time. He was protecting me from whatever I couldn't see. Like you just got to trust God. Every single step of the way, every season I've been through, every moment, at the end of it, you know what the revelation is? Like God was faithful. And perspective, it's all about our understanding. It's about where we find ourselves positioned. I'm now seven minutes and 30 seconds. I gave myself one minute over to you, but I want to finish with this because this is the one thing I want to say. You know, perspective, it's about understanding. We can't see it all. And we live in a world where the world's getting torn apart. I always think about the fact we've got like two eyes, you know, like, like why don't we have three? I know it's a silly little thing, but because like it's just everything in this world, we split it down the middle, like this side and that side. And my point of view, your point of view. My team, your team. And it's all based on our understanding. And at the end of the day, God just wants to shake us free of our understanding. He wants to enlarge. Mom talked about it this morning. He wants to enlarge the way we think and see Him. He wants us to get out of the way. He wants to carry all the stuff so that we can reveal who He is in and through us. It's actually not that difficult, even though at times it is. But like, I'm still here. Like, I'm still here. Like, I'm still in that place where I'm waiting. But I feel like now, because I've got better perspective, I kind of, I have a glimmer of a glimpse somewhat in a mirror, albeit in the fog of what God wants to do. And it's the most exciting thing in the world. And it seems impossible. But God, He's about transforming us. It's about renewing our mind. It's about having a pure heart. Those with a pure heart will see God. Blessed are the pure heart, for they shall see God. This is the scripture I wanted to bring. It's really simple. But like... Just eat it up for a second like it's the first time you've ever read it. And it probably won't go on the screen because I didn't tell them, but you'll know it. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge Him and He'll make your path straight. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. That's the only lesson. Like if I get to the rock bottom of it, like where there's like, yeah, there's a million other revelations in the middle, but what it comes down to is just trusting God. And so wherever you're at in the journey, you just feel like it's not measuring up to where you thought you'd be. We're all in that liminal space, kind of waiting for the other side. And, you know, you get to the other side of one thing and you find yourself in that space again. That's the journey of it. Some people are sitting here going, so what did he talk about? And they just wanted like a, a seven-step plan. Like this is the seven-step plan. If you want my message in seven steps, trust God. Step two, trust God. Step three, trust God. Step four, trust God. Step five, repeat steps one through four. Step six, trust God again. Step seven, trust God again. 
We don't graduate from that until we see kingdom come. But in the meantime, let's keep finding the poor spaces and turning them upside down for the kingdom of God. In Jesus' mighty name, I'm still here. You're still here. If you're still here, then I believe that there's a reason God's got you here. I believe that honestly. For us, you wanna know how to do it? Just keep waking up in the morning. Wake up tomorrow. His mercies are new every single morning. That's like literally before you even figure out which way is up or down, like God's mercy is meeting you. Don't, don't worry about what happened last night. Don't worry, just move on, keep going. Take another step. Keep breathing. If you've got breath in your lungs, keep breathing. I believe you're here for a reason. If you've got whatever it is in front of you, every single moment, like all those moments in between, the in-between spaces, wherever you find yourself, that's where God wants you. That's where God does the miracle. That's where God shows up. That's where Jesus reveals Himself. Don't underestimate the opportunities of these moments where it feels like you're out the back, you're doing little stuff. It's in those moments that God moves. Because this ain't real life. It's not. These moments, this is, I mean, it's real life. Don't get me wrong, but this isn't my life. This is just me talking about my life. We played MSG this year, like Madison Square Garden. Yeah, it was, but it wasn't, I, the whole time I was up there, I was going, this isn't real life. Like this is a flat, this is just a moment. It's awesome, but that's not it. Real life, man, is all the times we've been through on the way, you know, like all the little seasons and moments and sitting on the bus and talking about the things of God and trying to reconcile all the stuff we can't figure it out and loving it. And real life is watching guys like JD just continue to step into his calling and watching Jad just carry stuff with his big broad shoulders that no one knows that he has to carry, but he carries it. And sometimes he does it a bit grumpy and sometimes we've had a few fights along the way. But God, they're my favourite moments looking back on it. That's real life. So let me pray for you. And then we're gonna sing. And then Brooke, who I know is like a raging inferno wrapped up in a little plastic cup. I don't know what else to say. Um, I don't know. I feel like that's what God's got going, but we're, God's gonna do something tonight. God, I thank You for every single person here. I thank You for every single person who's still with us at home. I thank You that we're still here. And I thank You that You're still here. And God, we got nothing without You. And I thank You, Father, for every step of the journey where we haven't had, God, the eyes to see what it is You're doing and how it is You're moving. But God, I'd pray that You'd enlarge in our eyes to see You. God, ahead of time that would be up for the journey, God, that we'd keep showing up, that we'd keep waking up and stepping into what You've called us to. God, that You'd continue to move in and through Your people like You always have, but God, that we'd be people who'd have ears to hear and eyes to see. God, that You are not looking for perfect people. You're not looking for us to have it all figured out. You're looking for people who'd put their hand up and say, I trust You, and we do, we trust You with it all, God. I pray that we'd keep surrendering, God, that we'd keep letting go, that we'd keep giving up control, that we'd keep stepping in, God, in the waiting and all those moments, God. I pray that we'd be a people, Father, who You would see as faithful, God, that You'd continue to use us. We give You the glory for all that You've done. We give You the glory for all that You're doing. And God, we give You the glory here and now, right where we are, Father, and say again, that if You want, my heart, I won't second guess. Come on, sing. If you are my heart, I won't second guess. Come on.
There's something pretty beautiful about messages that come from authenticity, hey? Come from lives lived in front of us all. And so why don't you put your hands together and thank Joel for his transparency, his authenticity, for actually bringing a message of clarity.